Hello, this is Vic Johnson. We're at the 2004 Jim Rohn Weekend event, and what a special honor for me, an opportunity to spend a few moments with a hero of mine. Brian Tracy's been sharing with us this morning. We've got a few minutes now to, to get down and intimate with him. So, Brian, thanks for taking time out to, to visit with us. Thank you. Brian, you have been a student of success, I guess, for 40 years. Yes. And you've written that success is predictable. Right. And I know the way you analyze things that you've got to have a great explanation for us. What do you mean by success is predictable? And if I'm someone seeking that, what are some of the key things I need to be doing, looking out for, or whatever? Well, if you go into the kitchen to cook a dish, and the very first thing you get is a recipe, and you follow the recipe, and you work with the recipe, eventually you'll master that dish. Once you've mastered it and made it a few, it a few times, you can make the dish over and over again, and you'll remember the recipe. You don't have to keep going back to the recipe book. Now, if somebody says, boy, that's really delicious, you don't say, well, it's a miracle, like uh, something out of voodoo. No, you just followed a proven recipe that had been worked out by people before you. And that's basically the secret of success. If you want to be successful in starting a business, then you study what people have learned and everything that people have learned they've written down or shared in seminars or put onto audio programs is, I, I learned this from a very wise man named Kopp Koppmeyer who spent more than 50 years studying success. And he had developed more than 1,000 success principles that he had derived out of something like 6,000 books. And when I met him, I asked him the question you would ask. Of all these thousand principles, because I had studied it all, which is the most important principle of all? And he said, Brian, he said, it's simple. He said, use proven success methods. He said, learn from the experts. He said, Brian, you'll never live long enough to learn it all for yourself. So what I find is that successful people are those who learn from others who've gone before them. Unsuccessful people try to make it all up, like a cook going into the kitchen, taking ingredients out of the cupboards, throwing them all in a bowl, and wondering why it doesn't taste good. This is why people's sales careers, why 80% of salespeople are functioning well below their potential, only 20% make all the money, why 20% of businesses in any industry make all the profits, why 20% of the professionals in any uh, service uh, make 80% of the money, and so on, is because they follow proven success principles, proven recipes, proven formulas, proven combinations, and they just do them over and over again until they master them. Then they can do more and more of them, faster and faster, easier and easier, at a higher level of quality. And all that translates into greater results. Kind of following up on that, uh, obviously what it says to me, if I'm going to get the recipe for success, I'm going to have to find some people who already have mastered the recipe, so to speak. This morning, you talked about getting around the right people and how important that was, which sounds like kind of the same thing. I, fi I, get to, I find the recipe from the right people. Outside of seminars like this, yes. where are some places that if I'm looking for the right people, where can I find the right people? Where am I going to go find them at? Well, there, there, there's two or three parts of that. First of all, we are where we are and what we are because of the choices and decisions that we have made in the past. Uh, choices and decisions with regard to the jobs we take, the people we work with, the people we marry, live with, socialize with, the investments we've made, uh, the uses of our time, and so on. We are where we are and wh where we are and what we are because of our choices and decisions. So the starting point of change in our life is to make new choices and decisions which requires that we stop making old choices and decisions that are not helping us. In other words, to get into something new, you've got to get out of something old. To start associating with positive people, you've got to stop associating with people who are not helping you. And you're, you, in, in many cases, people realize they're going to have to break off old friendships, break out of relationships, I've seen this happen countless of times. Quit jobs, um, stop associating with negative uh, family members who are constantly critical, is you're going to have to, to reorient yourself to more positive people. Now, the third principle that's so important is this, is that um, there's a law of attraction in the universe that says that you attract into your life people and circumstances in harmony with your own thinking. So if you start to read really good material, set goals, uh, commit to your own personal development, strive to become good at what you're doing, listen to positive audio programs, associate with positive people like at this seminar, what happens is you set up a force field of energy that is invisible, but it attracts into your life people, circumstances, possibilities, opportunities 
that would not have been there in the absence of your own changed thinking. So all three conspire. Stop making bad decisions, start making good decisions, start associating with people who are, encourage you, are in harmony with what you think, and then trust to this law of attraction to bring the right people into your life. Right. I know you've written about that and the power of thinking, the power of thought. I've begun to make those changes in my life. I, I'm, I'm uh, very serious about it. I'm very dedicated by it. But I'm surrounded by some unsupportive people that I'm not ready to end a relationship with. Maybe a spouse. Maybe it's because in the past I haven't followed through on some of the things and they think this is just another one of those things. What would you suggest I do? How would I handle, how do I keep that proper balance, for instance, in my thinking, being positive, and at the same time I'm someone very close to me that can have a negative impact? What do I do until that person comes around? Well, there's the natural tendency when we hear or learn something great is we want to convince everybody else of it. All right? And you see this, people who quit smoking suddenly want there to be no smoking in the world. <laughs> people who adopt a religion or a political philosophy want everybody to join uh, the next day. But the uh, very best thing, as I mentioned earlier in our seminar, is that you must teach men at the school of example, for they will learn it no other. So what you need to do is be an example and be an example for a, an extended period of time. Give yourself two, three months, maybe a year, of being the new person. When you go on a diet, don't insist that everybody else go on a diet the next day. Actually go on the diet, stay on the diet, lose the weight, achieve the level of financial fitness, and attract people so they come to you and say, what is it that you're doing? Or what is it that you're reading? Or what is it that you have that makes you different? Only then, when they reach out, do you offer it to them. The flip side of this is that, in the main, people don't change. You can change, and you'll find it much easier to change if you're with positive people. Very hard to change with people who don't want you to change, who want you to be the person that you were. But in the main, people don't change. So sooner or later in life, you're often going to have to make some hard choices. Uh, in the short term, uh, be the person. As, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Be the kind of person that you want to see. And if that does not bring people around, then be prepared to go to the next step. Be prepared to walk away. Right. Something that interesting that you've taught on that I found remarkable was you said that if you write a goal down, yes. increase your chances of success by a thousand percent. Yes, by ten times. Overwhelming. Yes. Now, next to that, when it comes to goal setting, what's the most important thing I do? I've got it written down. Obviously, that's got power if it's going to increase my odds of success ten times. What's the next thing, the next biggest thing in that process? Well, there's a process which has made more people rich than any other single process of goal achieving. And it's to take your major goal and structure it as a question. If your goal is to earn $100,000 a year, then you write, how can I earn $100,000 in the next 12 months? Now, that's an open-ended question, not how can I earn it at my job or doing a specific thing, just an open-ended question, how can I earn the amount of money? And then you discipline yourself to write 20 answers to the question. And the 20 answers are all the different things that you could think of to earn $100,000. Work longer, uh, work harder, uh, upgrade my skills, get a new job, take a part-time opportunity. Uh, whatever it happens to be, write down everything you could think of, but force yourself to write at least 20 questions, or 20 answers to the question. The 20 question method, called mindstorming, forces you to dig deep, deep into your mind where you will find all your answers. And it may be call a person, uh, read a book. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we had a young fellow, entrepreneur, he got 35 years old. He'd built a successful business. He'd worked about 10 years to do it. And he, for two years, wanted to sell his business so he could take a year off and travel, enjoy his money. And so for two years, he just sort of floundered around like a fish on the dock, wanting to sell his business. Nobody uh, offered to buy it. He suggested it to people. Uh, people were not interested and so on. And in this exercise that they put him through, his 20th answer, and often it's the 20th answer that is the breakthrough, was buy a book on how to sell your own business. And it just went off like a flashbulb in his mind. At the break, he got up. It was a downtown hotel. Got up, went down to the street to a major bookstore, went and found he was amazed at the number of books that had been written on how to buy and sell a business. So he bought two or three books. Two months later, he had restructured 
packaged this business, sold it completely, satisfactorily, and took a year off. He said, but it was just a single idea. It was a breakthrough idea. But it was so simple, just get a book on the subject. <laughs> and you think, boy, that's pretty obvious, yes. But it's the most obvious answers that we overlook. I know that uh, you've built a lot of companies. I know you've coached a lot of people who've built great companies. You've been an inspiration and, and mentor to a lot of people. I'm a person who I've gone through maybe perhaps your goals exercise, which you have a very thorough goals exercise. I've put my goals down. I've got all the objectives and the task lined out, and I just can't seem to get started. And 90 days pass by, and I still haven't gotten started. Now I'm at the point where I'm starting to beat myself up and all. What's the key after I've got the, the mechanics, so to speak, in place? What, what's the, what can I look for, where, and where can I look for it to get started? This, this is one of the biggest of all challenges. It's procrastinating on starting on a major goal. And the way that you overcome it, one of many ways, is you break the goal down into as many small steps as you possibly can. You make a list of every single step that you're going to have to take to achieve the goal. From the first one of clearing your desk, or reading a chapter in a book, or making a phone call, or uh, working out a financial plan plan. So what you do is you break it down into small enough steps. Henry Ford said the biggest tasks in the world can be accomplished if broken down into enough small steps. And once you've broken it down into enough small steps, just do one step. Say so now of all of these steps, there are five minute, ten minute steps, of all of these steps, what would be a good place to start? And then you do just one thing. And maybe the next day you do just one more thing. And what happens within the mind is there's a natural momentum that once you get into the rhythm, you start to move forward. And pretty soon you're doing the next step and the next step and the next step and so on. I uh, had a, a good friend who had for years wanted to write a business book. And uh, he was working from 7 or 8 in the morning till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. He had a, never had the energy to write it. So he finally said, I'm going to write this book, so I'm going to write it one page at a time. So he rescheduled his life, so he came home earlier, went to bed by 9 o'clock, got up at 5 o'clock, and wrote one page. That's all. By the end of the year, he had a 350-page book. And he published the book, and it became a great success. But it was just writing one page a day that enabled him to write a bestseller. Right. I know another one of your great teachings is on the power of list. Yes. And you teach on that. Explain to me the concept and the power of making a list. Well, if you make a list, of, for example, I tell people for every task you have, you should make a list of everything you need to do. Uh, I'll give you an example that helped me recently. Uh, a gentleman came to me and said, uh, he's tied up a piece of property. We could develop this. It's 13.3 acres into a combination uh, shopping center and uh, self-storage site. So he said, would I be interested? And I said, well, sure. I've done real estate development in the past. And the first thing I did after we had tied up the property and established a partnership, it was a good deal, I sat down and made a list of everything that would have to be done from the very beginning to the very end to have an open, fully leased shopping center and a fully built, leased out self-storage center. And it was 40 or 50 things. And it started off with getting different approvals from the uh, Caltrans transportation, uh, getting utilities, getting the land graded, getting approvals uh, for um, uh, architectural approvals, especially it meant getting a uh, agreement from a major tenant, a major uh, supermarket, to take the major space because the city said we will approve the self-storage if you have a shopping center attached to it but not alone. The key to the shopping center was the supermarket. The key to renting out all the other spaces to have the supermarket and so on. So then we sat down and we just began to follow the list. One of the uh, ideas on the list was to bring in a major developer with uh, vastly more experience and contacts in shopping center development and carve off the self-storage for ourselves, do a partnership, a joint venture, and so on. So by the time we finished the list, we had done that. We had a major tenant. We had all approvals. We had road, we had transportation, sewer, utilities, highways, freeways, everything else. And the entire project is up and running on schedule. But if you look at it standing back, it's overwhelming. What you do is you make a list of everything that needs to be done. You select the most important thing on the list, the thing that you have to do before you do something else, and you start on that one task. And you just work away at it 
act like a force of erosion. You can do this with any day, write down everything that you have to do in the course of the day on a list. Any goal, make a list of every step in the goal. Uh, any plan you have, a financial plan, retirement plan, even if you want to write a book, what are all the things that you have to do in order to write and publish a book? And then you just start with one of those tasks. Fantastic. I get this question. I had, in fact, earlier today, and it seems we're getting more and more of it, maybe getting more and more of it from an aging boomer. Right. They're either not ready to retire or not able to retire. They've been doing what they've been doing for 20 years or 30 years. They probably didn't want to do it to begin with, but they're really sick of it now. Right. They either think they're too old or time has passed them by or whatever. Where can they find that passion? Where can they look in their life? Or what, what, would, you, what would you say to someone 55, 60 years old who really wants a life, who, right. who maybe hasn't had one? And how would, you, how would you coach them on finding a new career or finding a new passion or a new profession? All right, well, there's several factors. Uh, the first factor is if you reach the age of 50 or 55 and you don't have very much money, join the crowd. Because the great majority of people, according to the financial planning organizations, the asset management organizations, they say most people, even in their 40s, don't have much money to invest. In other words, their representatives are told, pass them by because they don't have the money. It's only in their 50s that people start to get serious about financial accumulation. The second point, which we talked about, is if you have no money saved up, you have no cushion, so you can't just walk away from your job and gaze at your navel and think about what you'd like to do in the great scheme of things. So the first thing you do is get your finances under control. If necessary, start to cut back on your expenditures. Start to eat at home more often. Think of selling and moving to a smaller house now that the children are gone. Think of driving your car until it falls apart rather than driving a new car. You've got to build up cash reserves. With no cash reserves, you're trapped, just like a, like a, uh, a mastodon in quicksand. You're trapped. You can't get out. So let's say you decide you're going to take a year. Over the course of the year, you're going to pull back on your expenditures by 10 or 20 percent. Get yourself out of debt. Get yourself some free room to run it. Then realize this, is that the retirement age of 65 was set back in 1870 uh, by Otto von Bismarck in Germany when they first developed the first retirement scheme. The number 65 was pulled out of the air. The interesting thing was that the life expectancy in 1870 was about 40 years. So when they said that at the age of 65, you will be able to retire and receive a pension, they never expected anybody ever to get it. But they picked it out of the air, and they picked a number so far in the future that they never have to pay it. Okay? When the retirement age was set in 1935, when our Social Security system was set up, it was also set at 65 because Bismarck had set it at 65 in 1870. The life expectancy at that time was 52 in 1935 in the United States and Canada. Well, nobody ever expected anybody to collect. And so they kept saying 65, 65. Even companies, because there was a job shortage during the Depression, put in regulations saying people would be forced to retire at 60 and 65. They couldn't work past that. And suddenly we had an explosion after World War II of health. Is longevity increased, lifespan extended. Now the average lifespan is 77 to 80 years, which means that 50% of the population will live to be 80 years or more, uh, and some 85, 90, one of the biggest growing groups in our societies, people over 100, by the tens of thousands a year. If they retire at 65, they will have literally burned off all their savings within a, long, long before they are really old. So my bottom line is this. The true retirement age today is 75, not 65. People are as physically healthy today at 75 as they might have been at 65 a few years ago. Um, most people, according to the AARP, more than 50% of people over 50 do not intend to retire until well into their 70s. Part of it is by uh, choice, is I don't want to retire. I want to keep busy. I'll do less, I'll do different, I'll do something else. A lot of it is because of necessity. They have no money. 
That's why they talk about senior citizens working at McDonald's. They don't work at McDonald's because they can hardly wait to work at McDonald's. It's because they just didn't save anything during their lives. But wherever you are today, remember that you current working, your working life is to 75, not 65. So if you're 55, that means you've got 20 full years, productive years, where you're going to be at the top of your game. You're going to be as good as you've ever been physically. So you're going to have lots of time to accumulate all the money that you need to be able to coast through the next 10 or 15 years after that. Fantastic. Great advice. One final question. I know you are an avid reader. Yes. If I haven't had that habit in my life, I I'm, I'm really haven't picked up a book maybe since high school, right. what are the five books I should start with? What are the five basic foundation books that I need to read first? Well, it depends upon your subject. It's a very hard uh, question to ask because uh, if you are talking about personal development or personal motivation, there's five books. If you're talking about history, there'd be five. Philosophy, five. Uh, economics, five. Politics, five. Selling, five. Business, five. I mean, you could pick them out of the thousands that are there. I would say, and I don't mean to be self-serving, but I wrote a book some years ago which has become a top seller worldwide. It's called Maximum Achievement. And it takes everything that's been written in the last several hundred years on personal success and reintegrates it at a new level. And I've spoken to many people here whose lives have been totally transformed as a result of reading that book, Maximum Achievement. After that, you can read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, read The uh, Power of Positive Thinking by um, Norman Vincent Peale. You can read The Power of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. Um, and uh, you could read... Um, what is that wonderful book by Napoleon Hill and W. Clement Stone um, about a powerful, positive attitude? Right. Once you start to, 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 to read uh, along that line, you will get all kinds of inspirations. The main thing is to read a chapter a day. Right. That's all. Don't worry about more than that. But a chapter a day will give, turn into about two books a month. Once you start to get excited about learning and applying, you'll read more. R subscribe to the magazines that are in your field because they have really good articles that are uh, very carefully vetted, can be very helpful, very motivation, motivational and stimulating, and so on. But just read 30 to 60 minutes each day instead of watching television and reading the newspapers. And that alone will change the direction of your life. Thanks for your wisdom this morning. You're welcome.